we 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 never set out to um you know to make something that was going to last as long as it did and it, and it ended up becoming like this really big thing that ran away from us and uh you know and now we're going to finally be putting it to bed i think uh you know that's not a bad thing <laughs> so so you what know? made it feel like the right time to to do that to be to be honest really i think um just cuz um you know pumping one of these movies out every single year it's really exhausting because the moment you know the film comes out right we 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 would have to get ready like the script and have to make it get into production and do it and get it ready by the next year it's it's really tax, taxing on uh, on the producers and the entire team so i think um you know i think um people are, are are tired and people feel like you know what um you know i think the audience have um you know you know you know, we, we get the impression the audience wants wants to move on from it, and that's fine. You know, and so we wanted to wrap it up, and we felt like this is the final one to wrap it up with. Yeah, yeah. That's really that's really the yeah that's really the, the long <laughs> the short of the long answer is um we all exhausted from it, and uh, it's been a great ride, and uh, it's time to uh, call it quits. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm curious. I, I want to talk about the origins of of Saw with you uh, as soon mm-hmm. as he calls in but as the series has progressed and, and you've served as uh, executive producer on uh, uh, many of the later installments mm-hmm. um, ha- have, has there ever been uh, a, a moment where satisfying the needs of the fans has has kind of butted heads with what fulfills you creatively where you think the series should go creatively well i you know it, it it's definitely yeah it, it it has been a very tricky process you know um just because unlike a lot of other horror films out there the soul films actually have a very intricate plot line you, you know mm-hmm, I, mm-hmm. I i i don't think yeah uh, I, I think it's like the only horror film out there that um that can never be accused of not having like any kind of story behind it. It <laughs> yeah. has story. It has plot points. If, if anything, I think to to a fault that sometimes it's too much, and uh, and uh, and it's kind of hard to keep track of it. So I think one of the hardest thing is really just like keeping track of where um, you know like timeline where things fall, what has been done, what hasn't been done, what other story strands there are to um, to explore. And you know, and when you're up to number seven, you pretty much explore everything. And I, and I think that's another reason too why we think you know what. We've pretty much explored all the story there is to tell, and I think, uh, and I think this is the perfect time to kind of stop now because there isn't really anything else to tell. Uh, at least, you know, at least at this moment, yeah, you know, we think, uh, you know, we think we've got to the end, and uh, we want, we want to, you know, call it, um, you know, click quits for now. Um, yeah. And, and I, and I think, you know, I think, uh, I think the producers, the actual producers, and the guys on the ground, you know, doing the real tough groundwork and all that, have um, have done a great job, you know, um, in you know keeping the fans satisfied, but at the same time trying to find something new and fresh to say. And uh, and you know that's definitely kudos to the producers and kudos to the um, you know other two writers that came on board once, um, you know, once um, Lee and myself were no longer. Um, you know, as hands-on with it as we were, you know, um, I mean, Lee wrote up to number three. Um, Mm -hmm. My involvement pretty much um, became less with two and then became less with three. And and that's only because, you know, I have my own movies to go and direct. So um, so it's kind of hard to, you know, still be, um, be... in the mix when uh, when you when you know when directing a movie basically takes up an entire an entire year of your life really right right and so so, uh, so yeah so it's been it's been a tricky one you know it's it's definitely very bittersweet for me to kind of uh, you know sometimes just have to kind of let it go and let other people take care of it right to some degree what, so what what has your involvement been th- these past few years in the series i mean they they obviously cons- do they consult you uh, about the directions that they want to take well um yeah they they, they definitely do to some degree and, and you know it's gotten to the point where you know kind of like i guess kind of like what carpenter ended up doing which was you know he just kind of gave his blessing <laughs> mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm. as a pope d- would you know, would do you know um you just kind of like um you know i it's got to the point where i feel like um the producers are so much more um you know so much more dull into the world than I am at this point. So um so my main thing and it was always my main thing with the sequels was just to make sure that that it did not become too ridiculously silly. 
Um, right. That that was the thing, and, and you know, and, and as you know, just the very nature of making sequels, they they oh, uh, especially sequels to horror film is they tend to you know. Um, break into those boundaries, you know, break the boundaries and into um, into territories where it becomes really outrageous. Fortunately for the Saw film, it, the, the, it's very outrageous to begin with, so it's not like uh, <laughs> so, so it's not like uh, if they got really crazy, it's not too far from what we had uh, established in the first film. Now, yeah. having said that, you know, having said that, I, I, I've always said the Saw sequels are definitely so much more. Um, you know, out there and so much more removed than the um, first movie that Lee and I made, you know. Um, and I think um, in a lot of ways, when people talk about the negativity of the Saw films, I like to put it down in some ways, they kind of lump the first film in it and they talk about the first film in this sort of retroactive way um, mm -hmm. where I, you know, I, I like to remind people to go back and see the first one. That The first one really was a, you know, it's a pretty by today's standards, a pretty low-key psychological thriller, you know, like um, there, there, there was very little traps, there was very little blood and guts, and a lot of that happened off camera anyway, you didn't see a lot of this blood and gut stuff, um, and it really wasn't until the sequels that um, that it, it kind of, um, you know, I guess, and the reputation of um, being the um, grandfather of you know, I hate using this term, but the torture <laughs> porn genre. Yeah, yeah. Um, I hate that term because um, I never set up to make a movie like that, and I don't think my first film was like that. But, um, but you know, but it ended up um, falling into um, that bracket. It absolutely was not the, the, your, your original film. I mean, your original film is a very tightly wound, claustrophobic uh, thriller. Right. And, and, yeah, uh, it was a thriller. Yeah, yeah. And, it, it wasn't a blood and guts um, horror film, so to speak. It was an outright thriller. Um, you know, in the same way, you know, like um, remember how like there was a period there before um, now the resurgence of respect for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Toby Hooper's version, right? But there was a period yes. there in the late '80s or in the '80s where people were just so against it, saying, "Oh, how bad that film was, and how like corruptive it was, and how blood and gory." And it wasn't until like recently, like in the late '90s or or, or, or recently, right, that people. Looked Look back and go. Look back at it and go. You know what? The first Texas Chainsaw that Toby Hooper directed is a masterpiece. Is a horror mm -hmm. masterpiece. You know, of suspense and tension and scare. And it only had like one or two little sort of gory set pieces that um, that really stood out in people's mind. But the rest of the movie wasn't like that at all. You know, I tell um, you, that, that's my, that's actually my all-time favorite horror film, uh, oh, the yeah. original Chainsaw, and Chainsaw, and it, right. it, it it's masterful in, in a way that Saw is masterful, in that in a lot of ways it deceives you into believing you're seeing a lot more than you're being shown. I mean, Hitchcock right. that was that was Hitchcock's playbook. Yeah, the most exactly. graphic thing about Chainsaw Massacre is the title, <laughs> the Texas yes. Chainsaw Massacre. You know, yeah, exactly. That, no, you're right. That the title was what put it into the video nasty category. Yes, the title yes. really made a lot of people believe that it was a much more nastier film than it actually is. And uh and I guess, you know, um I guess, you know, kudos to those guys for actually coming up with such a sensationalistic title that got a lot of people talking, you know? I, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, when you're making these low budget indie films, you know, you kinda need to stand out and back then that was their way of standing out and um you know, and for us with the first saw was, you know, finding, you know, like kind of cool ways to basically tell a story that people are pretty familiar with, which was, you know, a serial killer storyline, but try and find a fresh perspective to tell, um, you know, a story that we're all familiar with, but tell it in a different way. Yeah, and but you see this with all sequels. I mean, yeah. across across genres, the the more kind of sequels you make. You don't get more minimal in your approach. You you raise the stakes. You up the ante. Yes. You up you up the you, the, the murder quotient, exactly. the action quotient. Yeah. Right. So I think right. it's no, just you're, a product you're, you're totally, of that. You're totally right. I mean, especially um, sequels to action films. Look how huge the action movies get with every sequel, right? Yeah. I mean, look yeah. at look at the Transformer films. You know, like they just get bigger and bigger with each one. <laughs> you know, look at look at Die Hard. That's also another good example as well. How like each sequel. You know, like the first Die Hard was a Freaking masterpiece, you know. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and the second one is really cool too. But the second one is bigger than the first one, and then the third one is bigger than the, uh, you know, than the previous one, and the fourth one is bigger than the previous one. So, uh, you know, <laughs> um, and then and then you have your Star Wars um, sequels. <laughs> yeah, 
Exactly. It, it's, it applies across the board. If, yeah. if, if Lee calls in, I'll, I'll pick up his line right away. But uh, you must be a fan of the thriller horror genre. I mean, that must be of particular influence to you in, in your young life as you were planning to become a filmmaker, uh, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I, I am. I'm, uh, it's funny that you mention um, Hitchcock because um, I, I'm a big Hitchcock fan. You know, just like um, you know, just like in the way Hitchcock inspired people like Steven Spielberg. So therefore, I'm a huge fan of Spielberg. You know, obviously Spielberg is the generation of filmmakers that I grew up with. You know, from Indiana Jones to E.T. Mm -hmm. to Jaws. Um, I just think, you know, like I think um, of all the directors out there to, to take on um, the Spielberg, uh, to take on the Hitchcock mantle, it was Steven Spielberg who did it best, I think. A a and Jaws to me is one of the finest thrillers ever made, you know, horror yes. thrillers ever made. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I'm a big fan of like um, suspense, tension thrillers. Um, and, and, you know, and of course, you know, like um, um, I love the Italian Hitchcock, Dario Argento. Um, um, you know, who obviously brings his sort of um, quirky sort of European quality to um, um, to that sort of um, Hollywood style of um, thriller sto thriller storytelling, and you know, and bring a very sort of visual quality to it. And so, I I'm a big fan of Argento and Mario Bava, and um, and uh, and yeah. And when Lee and I first set out to make our first, you know, small little indie movie, we wanted to infuse the film with a lot of these inspirations and. Um, mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, uh, movies that 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 we love. Um, but but having said that, we wanted to do it our own way, and so yeah. yeah. So therefore, you know, we created our own villain. We created our own sort of you know sort of iconic take on things. You know, like like um, you know um, like. How do we hide the identity of the killer? Well, we hide the identity of the killer by having the killer speak through a puppet sitting on a tricycle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, 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 which always seems really funny when I pitch it like that. But, uh, but you know, for some reason, you know, it was just one of those things. You know, it was in the zeitgeist, and people just really caught on to it. They, they, it, you know, they, they, they love that, and uh, and and it's so funny that. Billy the puppet became the um, the face of the franchise. Yes, yes. Uh, when we spoke with Brian De Palma, who's uh, you know an exceptional director of thrillers, right. they they asked him why do you work in that genre, and he said, well, because it's the most cinematic of the genres. That's you, true. Yeah, I totally agree. Visual, yeah. Yes, I totally agree. And uh, and for directors that love to manipulate an audience, it is the best. It's the best genre, the horror thriller mm -hmm. genre, because um, you know, like you can literally, you know, you, you can make an audience laugh and scream, and you know, just like go through all kinds of emotion, um, you know, that um, that you you don't really find with a lot of the other genre. I mean, you know, you can make a, you, you know, you make a comedy, but usually, I can tell you, a lot of comedies don't. Scare you um, in the middle of the film. You know what I mean. Whereas, yeah. uh, whereas horror movies, um, horror films would scare the hell out of you, but then they'll kind of like, um, kind of like lighten that 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 mood a bit with something that 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 makes you kind of like laugh to relieve that tension. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and and so. Um, and, and you don't find that in a lot of dramas or, or any other genre. Um, but you do with the horror thriller genre because um, for a director, it's the most fun to play with because, you know, you compose your shots, you write your script in such a way, you craft, you know, everything is um, is the perfect, it's the perfect genre for a director who loves um, crafting the medium of filmmaking, you know, yeah. um, from, from visuals to sound designs to the way you interact, um, you block a scene, to the way you move the camera, to the way you you, you cut um, um, a sequence um, and the way it plays out and the way, you know, like you get your actors to, um, you know, um, emote, um, in, in, you know, in, in the scene and, and, and stuff like that. So um it's definitely yeah it's definitely one of my favorite genres to play in for that reason yeah it's a director's toy box i would think <laughs> that genre uh tell me about you and you and lee went to school together yeah lee and i met in college yes okay and 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 this collaboration is obviously a very successful one it's continued up till now you guys uh have insidious coming out and uh, we've actually spoke to patrick wilson and a little bit about insidious oh. and we're very right. excited about it uh what clicked between the two of you why does that collaboration work so well 
I, I, you know what? I, um, yeah, it's so weird, you know. Like, um, I, I mean, um, I, I haven't really worked in Hollywood for that long, but in the short amount of time that I've been here, you know, I, I, I have worked with a lot of different um, writers, and I've collab- collaborated with a lot of different artists. And it's funny that Lee Winnell is definitely still one of the people, um, if not the top person, that I get along the best with when it comes to um, when it comes to do with like ideas and concept and things that we have in common. When when it's um, when it comes to do with movies, we are so in sync. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we, we we love the same things, we hate the same things, and uh, and what I really admire about Lee as a writer and, and uh, as a concept guy as well is um he um you know like he never wants to settle for second best he's always like trying to push me to come up with the best concept best ideas and 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 and, and i really admire that about him and i find that um when he does that it really brings out the best in me as a director and uh, yeah. and, and his writing is really strong and you know he's a, such a he's a really great writer lee and um and even though we, we generally most of our movies we don't have a lot of money to work with but at the end of the day we realize um it's okay to not necessarily have like you know the big summer ten pole kind of budget to work with, as long as we get to tell our stories and we get to tell like smart you know stories that people haven't really seen before. Um, Lee and I really pride ourselves on coming up with things that are unique, and and it and, and you know and, and there's there's really only like what. 10, 12 stories out there that you basically just recycle again and again. I, I don't know which mm-hmm. you know great storyteller actually said that, right? Um, and, and all you do is really repackaging it. Um, but um, but uh, and even then, I find Hollywood is kind of lazy sometimes. They don't really make the effort to try and find new ways to tell the story. And uh, and that's why you know like I would read all these scripts, and to me they're so boring. All these scripts, they all read the same. They yeah. all have the same sort of. They're so predictable. And yet the films that get made, um, uh, you know, are these films that, that um, Hollywood's kind of afraid to take chances on films that are unique because, you know, they, they go, well, uh, we don't know if those films will be successful because it, it's not tried and true. It's not proven. It's not a formula. And uh, and I admire that about um, Winnell. So, uh, so I think that's why he and I have mutual respect and that, um, you know, like I come up with all kinds of crazy concepts and I throw it at Lee and I go, hey, Lee, what about a movie about this or a movie about about that and uh, and you know and and if he likes them, that's when I know I've come up with something really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, just you because he of... holds such a high standard to what is good. Exactly. Um, yeah, and you guys so... have ridden this roller coaster together. I mean, I mean, this tremendous success uh, of Saw. I mean, you, you guys got into it together, and and you guys have risen to the top together. Um, and I'm I'm, I'm curious. You you had it's no so idea. funny that you see that, uh, um, Jamie, because um, I still see myself as an underdog. <laughs> I still see yeah. myself in many ways. In, making it in the um, horror genre doesn't mean you're at the top of, of the game. I mean, you know, like maybe if you make it in the action or sci-fi or drama world, then you're at the top. Then you become like you know, like your Chris Nolan or your um, you know, or your James Cameron type, right? But um, yeah. uh, making it to the top of the horror genre, just because of the way people kind of look down on this particular genre, I'm like, you know what? For me, it still feels like I'm still at the bottom, and I'm climbing my way, you know, trying to make my way to the top. And I like that. I, I like being the underdog, despite the fact that I, um, that Lee and I have um, basically, you know, the, the biggest horror franchise out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know exactly what you're talking about, because yeah. there's a, there's an element to horror that is kind of disreputable. Right, exactly. Uh, and actually, some of the best, some of the best horror movies. Um, I mean, I think the horror genre almost works because of that. I mean, the best horror movies are underground. You know, they're yes. they're, they're they're done in that manner. Um, and and, you know, and the, it's, don't you don't you find it ironic that that um that um that a lot of the movies that deals with social ill or, or make yes. the loudest social commentaries are horror films. Yes. Yes. You know, I mean, my God, I look at Texas Chainsaw, and I look at movies like, um, you know, like Texas Chainsaw was such a um, was such a, uh, a, a commentary on the Vietnam War. I mean, my mm-hmm. my goodness, you know, and, and then you know, and then and you have Night of the Living Dead that was a commentary on, on the period that it came up with, and, and, and it's really interesting to hear people say that Source was the post millennium type of um, the first real post millennium horror film, and it, and and it is somewhat of a reflection of the era.
era and time that we now live in, you know, in, in the 2000, you know, like we've, you know, we've, you know, that that was that that is post 9/11, that is uh, post terrorism, and 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 it's a really different world that we live in. And I, I find um I find the horror genre more than any other genre in particular that really um that really um ties itself to the era the film was made in and um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and i and i don't mean it dates itself i just mean uh, it, it it kind of um it it is it, it, a big sort of social commentary about the era that it was made in if that makes sense I think so too, and it, it works as a classic thriller, so it's timeless in that respect. But when you look at it, as you say, through the prism of 9 11, how, how, how far are we willing to go to survive? Right. Uh, you know, right. Yeah, what are, we, what are we willing to compromise here? Uh, now, did that come into play as you were writing it? Was that just a byproduct of, of, of what you had ended up writing, or how did that. Um... You know, I I I, I think um, I um I, I wouldn't say we were um, you know um, consciously out there trying to make um, some kind of social statement, right? I, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that, but I definitely do believe in a in a in a big way. You know, like it did creep into our subconscious. I mean, it's hard for it not to be. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Especially when we made when we wrote this story in the um like. I think we came up with it like in the early 2000, you know, uh, um, the, the, the overall concept, or, or it maybe in, even the late 90s, like the, the, just the seed of it, right, the concept we come with, but we sort of didn't really sort of like form it till like, um, you know, uh, um, till Lee started writing the screenplay. Um, but, um, but, um, but yeah, um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> well, horror, horror movies, horror <laughs> movies are just ideally suited to 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 make social commentary and and right. when and, and the thing is, you can make those social commentaries and get away with it that you may not be able to do so in other genres. Maybe the only other genre is comedy where you can make fun of someone yeah. and get away with it because that's funny, you know. And you don't have to hit people over the head with it unless your villain actually hits someone over the head. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Uh, yeah. What do you think the legacy of, of, of the series will be or is? Um, you know what's really incredible is I, I you know, like um, you know, I, I would get fan mails and I, I, I would get you know, so like Facebook or, or MySpace messages from people, right? From especially like um, you know, like young adults and, and teenagers that that loves this this franchise um and, and the one thing that seems to be very common is how they would point out um how um they love that the movie deals with a villain who um basically asks you to kind of um take a look at your life and, and and appreciate what you have and not take it for granted what you have right you know like yeah. um you know it, 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 you know in a very 80s and 90s world where um we kind of take everything for granted and it was very celebrity cultural driven right mm-hmm. um, um it's really interesting to hear today's kids actually say to me that they uh, that they really latch onto that idea um the concept of not taking what you have for granted and and, uh, and, and kind of like um you know kind of um be thankful of what you have so um so that has been a big part of a legacy that we never actually thought that people would latch onto, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but but they've definitely latched onto um, the subtext of the film, which is incredible. I mean, um, you know, obviously um, the stuff that, that people that the fans left on the surface is, of course, you know, like the the cool fun traps, you know, the um, the twisted mystery, you know, uh, uh, um, yeah. and, and, and the twist ending, and, and you know, the, the the sort of messed up nature of it all, which is, you know. At the end of the day, you know, Saul really doesn't try to pretend to be anything other than, you know, it's a roller coaster ride. But in amongst all this stuff, you know, um, um, when Lee wrote the first script, he, he tries to make it more than just a throwaway horror film, you know, like like yeah. any good writers would want to do, you know. So, well, uh, it, so yeah, like like any great movie, it, it entertains as you're watching it, and and it lingers. When you leave it, you know. I mean, it gives you something right. more to chew on. To it's, think it's, about, it's, right? Yeah, it's about morality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I think, um, I think the the, the um, other big legacy that we cannot ignore, um, as well as um, the fact that, um, um, you know, Saw 3D, which is Saw number seven, right? It's about to come out. It, it comes out this weekend. Um, mm-hmm. um, 
Um, what 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 that legacy has done by having a, a new Saw movie come out every year is it's become such a big part of um, a staple, of such a big part of like these kids growing up. It's a big part of their life. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Because like every Halloween, they got a Saw film to look forward to. They they know um, that there's a Saw movie coming, and that's why. Um, uh, it, it, it's kind of sad, I guess, it, 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 in the respect that um, you know, I, I get a lot of Facebook messages from these these fans saying um, that they, they 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 find it sad, sad in a nostalgic kind of way that you know the film is coming to an end because um, it's a big part of growing up for them, you know. Um, yes. Every year during Halloween, they've got that to look forward to, and now it's finishing. So um, I think that's the other legacy as well, you know, um, that that. There's a generation of kids years from now when they grow up, you know, like you know, when they're in their late 20s or 30s or whatever, they will look back and they'll, they'll have, they have such they have such memory, whether it's fond memories or not, they have such memories of um, their, their teenage years growing up, right, off the Saw films. Yes. I mean, oh. it, pl- it, it can play as integral a part in their, in their adolescence as, you know, Jaws played for you when you were a kid. Exactly, and the way yeah. Jaws scarred me for life about not wanting to jump into the ocean. Yeah, uh, yes. but the funniest thing is, um, I would hear people go, "Oh, you know what? I got my first kiss while on a date to watch the, one of the Saw films." <laughs> I would hear that a lot. Wow. To which wow. my reply, to which my reply would be, "You're welcome." <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I really appreciate your time, and I'm so so sorry about the technical problems. But no before I let you before I let you go. Uh, in, Insidious, your your next yes. film. Do, is there a release uh, date set up for that film? Um, no, not 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 yet. Um, you know, like um, um, you know, I- I- even though we did kind of get a version of the movie um, ready for the festival, which which we did get it ready for Toronto, we premiered the film at the Toronto International Film Festival, mm-hmm. um, which it was you know really well received. And I just got back recently from Spain because it played at Sitges. Um So even though um, you know I got a version done, but I had to really rush, like um, like any movies that. That are not quite finished yet, but they want to get it ready and get it into a festival. Is you you kind of like rush to try and get things done. So I'm actually still tweaking and still putting the finishing touches to it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, I like to think it's going to come out sometime next year because um, there's really only what two months left in this year, so it's definitely not coming <laughs> out this year. Um, and uh, and Lee and I are so excited about this film because we feel like um, we've um, we, we've finally made a movie that um, we think is um, you know after Saw we, we we went and made Dead Silence and though Dead Silence is a fun movie we felt like we didn't get to set up to make the scary film that we wanted and I think mm-hmm. in a lot of way Insidious is that film you know it's when you watch Insidious, you can tell our love for the genre. We we wear our love for the genre on our sleeves with this film. But at the same time, we did what we did with Saw, which is we find a fresh perspective to um to what is essentially is a pretty stale you know sub genre, which is the haunted house genre. I mean, uh-huh. my God, uh, the haunted house movies have been done to death. And so once again, you know, Lee and I, I like to think, you know, we found a fresh angle to it, and I think um, the fans really responded to it at um, Toronto. Now we turn to the co-creator of the Saw series, Lee Wanell. Lee is the writer of Saw, Saw Two, and Saw Three, and played the role of Adam in the first Saw and Saw Three. And- On the one hand... I feel artistically that going on for too long uh, can make you a punchline. You know, as we've seen with films like Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street and even non-horror films like Rocky, it, 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 you, can, you can become a punchline if you keep flogging a, a dead horse. Um, yeah, not just flogging it, but, you know... Uh, <laughs> Punching it, electrifying it, and, do, and doing everything else to milk every last drop out of it. So I don't really want that to happen to the Saw films. Some people may say that ship has already sailed, but but then on the, on the other hand, it's uh, it's kind of the end of an era for me. I mean, for James and I, Saw started in 2000, really. So it's really been the last decade of my life. So it's definitely. Um, you know, a, a little bit of time for reflection and a, and a little bit melancholy in some ways, just seeing this era come to an end. Right. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, James and James Wan, your, your, your creative partner, 
and y'all met in college, and y'all have been collaborators on pretty much everything for the last decade. And so I'm curious, what is it about that collaboration? Uh, what what is it that clicks between you two? Do you all have similar sensibilities, or do you all have different sensibilities and they complement each other? That's an interesting question. Um, I think that we were friends first. We uh, we met at film school and became friends, and I think that always helps. I certainly think it think it can't hurt. Uh, although. <laughs> Maybe I have to retract that because I, um, sometimes working together can hurt a friendship. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had that happen with me. But for some reason, uh, James and I, we became friends and we definitely, we definitely had a shared sensibility in terms of our taste and the types of films that we talked about and got excited about. Um, we were never in competition. You know, I think that James is a real encyclopedia when it comes to film. He He's that guy who, who can name the best boy of, <laughs> of a film. You may love it and you may know who directed it, but he knows who was the grip on it, who served the catering. So he kind of has this encyclopedic knowledge and I was always really respectful of that and kind of in awe of it. I was always, you know, entertained hanging out with him and talking about, these films and then when we started working together it just seemed like a natural fit because he wanted to be a director that was his big goal and I wasn't as focused on that um, I thought that my strengths were more in writing at least for the time being so that we were never treading on each other's toes <laughs> and I just think that uh, if you stay respectful of those boundaries um, you can really have a thriving partnership. Um, but it's an interesting thing to think about, you know. Beyond that, I just, I think that we do have a shared sensibility when it comes to what we react to, you know, what, right. what makes us, you know, I've had a lot of other people talk about film ideas and maybe propose writing together, but I've noticed that a lot of times their ideas don't always gel with mine and the things that they think are cool aren't exactly the things that I think are cool. And for some reason, with James and I, they seem to be in alignment a lot. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I'll ask you this as kind of a fun college question. Was there a a movie or a director or a genre that that first, you know, you and you and James kind of clicked, you know, bonded over? Ah, let me think. I would have to say it would be a split decision between the Evil Dead films, anything to do with Sam Raimi, and John Woo. Right when we were at film school, right in the mid-90s, is right when uh, Hong Kong action films started to become popular, and it was seen as this big new thing. You know, now everybody has sort of... Uh, plundered their Hong Kong sensibility so much that it seems like old hat. But uh, you know, if you cast your mind back to 1995, it was it was just starting to catch on, and that was amazing for me. I, I remember being really obsessed with the kinetic energy of those films, and because I was at film school, I was really obsessed with the camera, the way the camera moved, and and both of those filmmakers, Sam Raimi and John Woo, have a very um, have a very uh, acrobatic. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of the word. Just, 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 just. I don't want to say the word show off, but they have a very showy style. The camera's moving and doing these crash zooms and slow motion. And but I think James and I had a shared love of that. We could talk for hours about John Woo or San Raimi. <laughs> right. And was was this uh, you know the, the inspiration of Saw? You know, this hor you know going into horror. Was uh was a what was the inspiration of that? Was it a matter of that was just kind of a fun thing, or was it also kind of the economics of it, and that you know horror can be done relatively low budget without the uh, necessity of uh you know names you know named actors when you want to break in. Right. Um. Definitely the latter. Although James and I loved horror films, and I think that even if 
uh, you know, a rich uncle of ours had come to us and said, I'll give you 20, you know, well, I'll give you, you know, $3 million to go off and make the film you want. We may have made a horror film anyway because we did love horror films. Mm-hmm. But I do think uh, what you're talking about played a, a big role um, uh, when we finally realized after film school that making a film is quite hard. It seems obvious. <laughs> but it seems like such an obvious thing, but I think when you're young and naive and you've just gotten out of film school, you have all these hopes and dreams. And uh, we quickly found out that uh, finding the money to make a film is really the ultimate obstacle. You might call it the only obstacle. You know, once once you've gotten the money, you can, you can go with God. But... Um, once we figured that out, we were like, uh, okay, this film's going to have to be set in one room with two actors so that we can pay for it ourselves. So right. that that was really what gave birth to Saw. It, 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 it was truly a case of necessity being the mother of invention. You know, if you, if you look at the storyline for Saw, it's two people chained up in a, in a room, and uh, that was all we could afford. Um, and now, of course, we went on to make the film with a... With a bigger budget than our than the five thousand dollars we thought we were going to be making it with, but it's still really stuck to that low budget template. Right. And at what point, in, in whether it was in the making of that film or maybe when when it became a hit or or maybe it was during the sequel or whatever, but at what point did you realize that the character of Jigsaw, like that you you guys created a character that's going to be part of that, you know horror hall of fame of you know psycho killers if you will (laughs) i think i started really noticing that when saw uh began being mentioned in 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 larger pop culture you know it's one thing to have horror films horror film fans line up and say hey i loved your stuff but it was another to hear saw references cropping up on the simpsons um, South Park, uh, and really the clincher for me, <laughs> the ultimate moment for me was when we were mentioned on The Sopranos, which was my favorite show at the time, right. over, over the moon. I couldn't believe that uh, that uh, that Chris from The Sopranos mentioned Saw by name. Right. And I guess that was, the, that was the moment where it clicked that I realized that Saw had become a part of the cultural conversation. And I think that's what horror villains need to do to enter that Hall of Fame you're talking about. You know, uh, everybody knows who Freddy and Jason is. You know, I mean, maybe not my grandmother, but generally the the, the mainstream public at large knows who they are and sort of uses them as a yardstick for for horror iconography. And, and, And once I knew Jigsaw had entered the mainstream, I knew that we were... We we we, we uh, were going to be iconic in some way, right? And you were involved, uh, you know, at some level up until you know all the way through part three. And so I'm curious what what has been your role of of your involvement since then? Obviously, you guys have come back for this final one, but in the interim, were you all just kind of you know consultants and or gave your blessings, or did you all or did y'all ever, you know, try to put more input into those latter sequels and maybe, you know, other people decided to go another way and but now you decided to get more involved? I'm I'm just curious how your how's your relationship been with these films in the later years? It's been an interesting relationship. It's been uh involved but separate, if that makes sense. It's we, we've we've kept in contact, obviously, with the producers and the filmmakers, and we, you know, definitely uh, we definitely have a say, and we can, you know, we go and and watch a cut of a film each year, but we're not as involved as you might think. We uh, we definitely stepped away from the sequels. We had our own films that we were working on, and we, I guess we trusted in in our collaborators, like. Oren and Mark, they've been through the trenches, and, and, you know, Jason Constantine from Lionsgate, all these people that have worked with the franchise, we trust them, and we let them go and make the films they wanted to make. And, you know, 
thankfully they've stuck to the the template that we set and they haven't done anything that's made us cringe. So we've been happy to sort of step away and, and just let them go. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a point of of you uh, of you guys, you know, wanting uh you know, having an idea of what was you know, what would be good for a certain instance versus what other people might have thought, you know, the fans wanted, you know. There's always that clash between what the creative people want to for the series to be and then for other people saying, Well, that's good but the fans really want this and Yeah, I think it's 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 been interesting watching Saw develop. Um the first Saw film, James and I really saw it as like a a locked room thriller. We weren't we weren't trying to come up with a horror franchise. We were just trying to make a film and we loved this story. And for us, funnily enough, the juice of the story, the thing that made us excited was the two guys stuck in the room in the in that first movie. We knew we had a great ending and we loved the idea of a film opening with two guys waking up and not knowing where they were. We thought that was really compelling. Now, of course, you know, when I was writing the screenplay and I you know, invented the character of Jigsaw, I really invented him as a function of that story. For instance, I knew that I knew that there was two guys stuck in a room, but I had to figure out who who put them there. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't like it wasn't like the character of Jigsaw came first, and then we thought, okay, what's the situation? Oh, okay, he's he's changed two people up in this bathroom. It was it was definitely the situation first, then the character, and I had to sort of invent the character to fill in the blanks. So what was interesting when the film came out was that you talk about the, the fans latching on to certain elements. I do think that fans and, and audiences make films their own. Mm -hmm. I remember a, a, a Cameron, Quo, Cameron Crowe quote about Jerry Maguire. He, he wrote that film and he, he had deliberately tried to uh, invent this phrase for Cuba Gooding Jr.'s, Jr.'s character, and when the movie came out, the, the quote that the audience grabbed the hold of was, show me the money, which he had, he had never thought of that as the big quote of the movie. Now everybody identifies that quote. And so I guess that's an example of the audiences telling Cameron Crowe what was memorable. You, mm -hmm. you can't tell an audience what they'll like. They pick their own moments. I guess that's the great cinematic democracy. And so what happened with Saw was that one thing they really grabbed a hold of which was a secondary element in the, first, in the first film, was the traps. I mean, if right. you think about it, the first Saw film, we, we only saw the, the, the traps very briefly in flashback, and it was more to help set up this character. Um, the sequels have gone on to make the traps and the character of Jigsaw the, the guts of the series. And that's been interesting to watch. It, it speaks to what you're saying about the the creators wanting the franchise to go one way and, and, and then the fans saying, no, no, no. And so, you know, I, I think that the sequels have become increasingly more violent, much more violent than the original, and they've become much more about the traps and how complicated they are, and that's fine. You know, I don't have a problem with that, but it's interesting. It's, it's, not, it's not what the first film was about. Right. Um, so that's that's definitely been interesting. Well, two two more questions. One, uh, bringing it bringing it all home to Saw, you know, this final Saw, and it's in 3D. And so, how do you feel about this final installment? How do you feel about it? I like it. I, I really do like it. I think it's a good way to close out this. I really see the film, the series, as being two trilogies. You've got the first three films. And then you've got the second trilogy, four, five, and six. And in the, the second trilogy, was, which was written by different writers, they came up with their own characters and their own world. And I sort of think that this sequel kind of cl gives some closure and some finality to both trilogies. Mm -hmm. it, it references the first trilogy of films and the characters James and I created. Um, and it also obviously wraps up some loose ends from the second trilogy. So it's kind of, you know, 
a seventh film is kind of a nice number to give balance to both of them. And I also think the 3D is a fun gimmick too. And and uh, the last question related to Saul, I'll ask you, have you and, and, and James, have you and Mr. Wan, are you, are you all okay now? I mean, you, do you all realize that from here on out that, you know, every Halloween, you know, these films are going to be brought up and, you know, you know, horror conventions and genre conventions, you know, you, you guys forever now are going to be a part of that apparatus of, of, of film culture. Well, yeah, I, I, it's, it's difficult to, to comprehend things like that on a moment to moment basis, you know, cause I'm just living my life and doing my thing like everyone else. But every now and again, I'll, I'll, I'll be driving down the street, usually during Halloween time, like you said, and I'll look up and see the jigsaw puppet's face on a billboard. Mm-hmm. And it, it just hits me that, <laughs> that this is really something that isn't going to go away. It's part of the cultural conversation now. And it's, it's, it's really amazing. I'm really, I'm really thankful for it and kind of humbled by it because something that James and I created in the suburbs of Melbourne, you know, all the way on the other side of the world, has resonated with Americans and, and with people across the world, in Europe and, and everywhere. So that's pretty incredible. I mean, it's hard to... I guess it's the same feeling a musician gets when they write a song in their basement just on an acoustic guitar, and then it goes on to become a, a number one hit and, and something that people love. It's kind of hard to comprehend that something you do in private could connect with a world audience, and I'll always be thankful for that and and be humbled by it. And you mentioned the, uh, the the jigsaw puppet, you know, pops up at Halloween. I'm curious. Over the years, has there been a like, you know, offers or you know maybe what was the craziest offer of a uh, jigsaw tie-in? You know, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> were there ever you know did anyone ever propose you know jigsaw condoms or something? Anything? <laughs> I never, uh, maybe that question might be better asked of the uh, Lionsgate uh, uh, marketing and merchandising department, <laughs> but but um, no one's actually proposed anything to me directly, although I can say that I did think it was nuts when the Jigsaw roller coaster opened in, uh, there's a theme park in England apparently, I think it's just out, an hour outside London, there's a theme park with a with a roller coaster where you get strapped in and you are subjected to a, 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 a jigsaw ride. I've never been on it. Apparently you hear the voice and uh, you hear you hear Tobin's voice tell you that you only have, you know, minutes to live. That's definitely that's definitely crazy to think that uh that somewhere out there on the other side of the world there's you know British teenagers are strapping themselves into a roller coaster uh, again because of something that that James and I invented years ago back in Melbourne. And and uh, uh, but yeah, I wish I could think of a better answer. I will say this: one of the gr- best moments ever for me. I used to collect toys uh, when I was in Melbourne. I would collect the horror movie toys that they usually sell at comic book stores. Right. And. Uh, you know, I had, you know, Ash from Evil Dead and Freddy and, and uh, you know, Jason, uh, Michael Myers and Leatherface. I had, I, I, I sort of spent my 20s collecting these toys. So one of the greatest moments for me was seeing the Jigsaw toy come out. <laughs> um, some company somewhere released uh, a Jigsaw figurine and I bought a few of them and I was just so... Shaft. I couldn't believe that I that I, that that was really that was that was good closure for me. It's like right, I finally made it. A character that James and I created is has its own line of toys. Well, and uh, to bring it into the future, I'll ask you what what can you tell us? Cause I know uh, I know the film has just been bought, and so if they're still planning out the market and so forth. So, what can you tell us about you and James's? next film Insidious I know it's played at festivals and it's gotten positive reviews and positive responses so what can you tell us about Insidious uh, 
Uh, Insidious is really James and I's take on the Haunted House film. I mean, what we generally like to do and what we try to do with Saw is take something that maybe you think you've seen before and give it a new, unique twist. I mean, no matter what you think of Saw, uh, whether, you, whether you love it or you hate it, I definitely think there's some pretty bizarre, unique elements. And maybe they don't seem so bizarre anymore because they're so ubiquitous. Like you said, the jigsaw puppet, you've seen it enough that you you, you take it for granted now. But if you think back, that's pretty bizarre to have a, a killer running around who speaks through this bizarre ventriloquist puppet that rides around on a trike. I, I do <laughs> like that... I do like that James and I seem to come up with these things that are pretty out there. I mean, a lot of people have told us that, and and that's why they're probably polarizing, you know. Uh, We we don't like to sit in the middle ground. We like to do this unique stuff. And so I would say that Insidious, if you can imagine the the thoughts that went into creating a, a sinister puppet on a tricycle, Imagine that same thought process applied to the haunted house genre. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it, it, you know, we screened at Toronto and the film was bought by Sony. And um, we've been chatting with them. We're so excited about it. It's kind of good timing that this era of Saw is coming to a close and hopefully we're going to be able to release a new film, a new horror film, and have people love it. Go, I mean, we should be so lucky that people connect with Insidious as much as they have with Saw. But we're definitely trying to say, hey, we're still here and we've got... <laughs> we're not one-trick ponies. We've got more ideas up our sleeve. Right. And any idea on the release? Is, it, is this going to be spring or is this going to be held towards, uh, you know, summer or Halloween next year? Any, any I actually ideas? don't... I actually don't know. They haven't even hinted at that. The first thing they wanted to do was sort of just um, talk about, um, you know, testing the film. And there's a whole process that a studio has to go through before they decide on a release date. So I really have no idea. Um, I'll I'll be as surprised as you are when they finally talk about when they're going to release the film. But I'm sure it'll it'll be sometime next year. I would uh, be certain of that. And I'm I'm really excited about it. I mean, I've had film experiences in the past, say with Dead Silence, where I felt like the end product was compromised and I wasn't that excited about the release of the film just because I felt like it, it, it's not the film that we set out to make.